All right, everybody, we'll get started. Uh, just a reminder for the students that are in here registered for credit, make sure you um, put your name on the sign-up sheet before you leave today to get credit. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome Professor uh, Vladimir Stoyanovich from uh, UC Berkeley. He's an associate professor in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. Um, and uh, he received his PhD from Stanford University in 2005 um, and a degree in engineering from uh, the University of Belgrade, Siberia in 1998. Uh, he was with Rambus, which is a um, you know, big high-speed uh, high um, serial interface company doing chips for serial interfaces uh, in Silicon Valley. He was there from 2001 to 2004. And uh, he was a uh, professor at MIT from 2005 to 2013. And he's received a number of awards, many awards, but I'll just mention a few key ones here. Uh, he, 2006 IBM Faculty Partnership Award, uh, NSF Career Award in 2009. Um, and then he won the 2010 ISSCC International Solid State Circuits Conference um, Jack Raper Best Paper Award. And then he's also been a distinguished lecturer for the uh, IEEE Solid State Circuit Society. So Vladimir is actually, what, the thing he's going to talk about is, you know, really we're in this, you know, putting this in context, we're sort of in the end of Moore's Law era, as we, as we know it. So we can't really scale um, transistors much smaller. So what's really happening is we're, you know, you have these huge systems that you're integrating onto a substrate with, you know, that's really nothing bigger than, a, you know, wider than a human hair. And so it's not just only integrated circuits, but other types of devices, like silicon photonics, uh, NEMS relay switches. And I think he's going to talk a little bit about integrating multiple technologies all onto one chip. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, uh, Vladimir. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And good morning to everyone. Uh, so indeed, I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of a taste uh, what new capabilities we can essentially bring to silicon technologies by trying to introduce some new types of devices in the processes. And kind of you'll, hopefully you'll be able to see that um, it's not actually that hard to do. You just have to think a little bit outside of the common like a process development uh, box. And of course, first I'd like to start thanking the whole team who's been working with me for all these years. Uh, you'll see a lot of people here, Milos Popovic, Rajiv Ram, um, and Chris Asano, which is faculty, and a lot of postdocs and students who really try to uh, put together these big chips and, and processes, and also like the foundries like Micron, CNSC, and uh, IBM and Global, and of course, uh, DARPA, who uh, funded most of the research, um, and NSF. So I sort of want to start with kind of what's happening right now in semiconductor industry. Uh, if you take a look at it, uh, pretty much every major foundry right now around the world has a play in silicon photonics, right? And what I, what I say has a play means that they have been developing internally silicon photonic processes or ways to integrate photonic devices with normal CMOS chips for a number of years now. Or they have just incorporated on their kind of a roadmap. Unfortunately, none of these are straight up available to researchers like us to just go and build interesting systems. So if you are kind of a circuits person and you're thinking of building the next high-speed interconnect or a sensor person, you want to build the next LiDAR, you won't be really able to just go and sign up for a process and use it. Uh, so what we did um, over a number of years was trying to figure out cheaper ways to get to these electronic photonic systems earlier than when these fabs come online. But the point that these fabs right now have it in the pipeline tells you about kind of what's the importance of these new applications, right? So, um, okay. We've kind of shared this view instead, at least kind of in the very early developments of uh, our electronic photonic systems. And you could say this is kind of a Berkeley-inspired view, because even though I was a grad student at Stanford, I visited BWRC, Berkeley Wireless Center, a lot for some collaborations. And I was kind of really mesmerized by, uh, at that time, their millimeter wave project, where you know, they essentially took 
for granted that you know you could essentially take a metal line in CMOS. At that point, it was like 65 nanometer CMOS technology, and try to make a transmission line out of it. And obviously, knowing by the previous examples of you know people messing with inductors and trying to put them into bipolar processes, and then you know into CMOS eventually, and off there you go with the CMOS radio revolution. Uh, they tried to do the same thing with millimeter waves, right, with transmission lines. Of course, that's not going to be a perfect transmission line, just like this inductor has actually a very poor Q um, quality factor, but it does the, it does the job. Right? So the whole idea was, can I create passives like inductors or like transmission lines? They're just good enough for me to do my job. Right? And the moment I can, then the economy of scale and the ease of printing stuff in CMOS circuits takes over, and that application really hits off. So by the same token, essentially, we started a project saying, OK, we, we don't have enough money to invest to significantly modify a CMOS process to build the best photonic devices in the world. Um, foundries may have that, or uh, research groups who are much richer than us. But what we can do is look at a reasonably advanced CMOS process and try to figure out, can we build good enough photonic devices in these processes with no process changes? And so 2012 was kind of the first Hello World set of devices that we built in a 45 nanometer SOI process. And I'll tell you more about kind of what that process really is, where we were able to build a waveguide, a modulator, grading couplers that you use to couple the light in and out of the chip, essentially a whole portfolio of devices that you would need both for like a high-speed link type system or any, pretty much any other electronic photonic system that you may want to have, right? And that really got us uh, engaged in trying to really improve these devices even further. So I'll show you uh, throughout the talk how we do it and also some of the uh, early big demonstrations and the kind of the uh, the, the latest results. So first about the process, you know, we picked a process that was essentially state of the art. And even though it's an older process right now, people are talking about 10 nanometer rolling out and seven, um, if you look at these more scaled processes in 45, they are more energy efficient, but they're not faster necessarily. This process is kind of like a, the fastest one you will ever see essentially in transistor scaling. Right? Um, it was used to build IBM cell processor, power, espresso, so a whole portfolio of IBM really from low power to really high performance processors. Every supercomputer in the US has Blue Gene Q processors that are basically built in this process. Right, so it was kind of a good starting point for us, an interesting thing to look into. Okay. And if you take a, a wafer and you cut it, you will basically see something like this. This is a cross section of the process. Right? And in here, you essentially see you know, transistor cross-sections, so source and drain, gate. It's still a planar process, so you have still uh, a polysilicon gate here. Um, this is an SOI process, and what that means is that there is a buried oxide that separates the silicon substrate from silicon body of the transistor. Right? And that is one of the key things that we need in silicon photonics. We need and a silicon layer that is surrounded by oxide so that we can guide light, right? So that silicon will be essentially the core of your waveguide and the, the uh, oxide will be the cladding. And so um, if you look at over here, we essentially can define a waveguide. This is about 100 nanometer thick silicon. Uh, it's surrounded by oxide. And all we need to do to realize a waveguide is essentially block all the dopings that exist in this process. So every single well, trans halo, uh, source drain, uh, gate, everything. Draw. Block everything, block silicides, and also block a few levels of metal around it because since we use the thin uh, body, the mode kind of expands a little bit outside of the waveguide. So you don't want the mode of the light overlapping with any metals because that adds loss. Uh, by the same token, you can put a polysilicon gate. Again, you have to make sure it's not doped, right? Um, over and create a 3D structure. And you will see later that comes very useful if you want to manipulate the angle of light. It creates intentional scattering, like in the vertical grading couplers. If you want to create little antenna arrays, uh, 
of light, you will use basically uh, these 3D structures. Uh, we cannot afford to have partial etch. Other foundries would basically come with a slab here and then just etch down uh, and have like a, this shape out of a single material like silicon. We cannot afford to do that because we cannot change anything in the fab. This chip goes in just like any other chip. Right. Now, um, for example here, this is the example of these rich, uh, grading couplers, so small scattering antennas. Uh, and then uh, we can also uh, essentially dope these waveguides um, and create PN diodes or PIN diodes, and that will give us modulators and photodetectors. And I'll talk a little bit more about these other things. So essentially, it is a platform where I can build a whole portfolio of photonic devices. And when I get the chip back, it's not gonna quite work. I have to do one more step, and that's kind of what's special uh, processing. I need to do substrate removal underneath the photonic area because this oxide is only about 150-ish nanometer thick. So it's not enough to isolate the optical mode away uh, from silicon. And especially if you try to guide light here and you have silicon here, it would leak out and your loss will be 1,500 dB per centimeter. So you won't be able to get anything. But the moment you remove that substrate, you essentially get really good loss properties, as I'll show you later. So this is one step, but you do it after the chip is back in your own kitchen, so to speak, right? We do that Berkeley Nanofab, really simple step. Um, so once you have this platform, what do you do in terms of the, um, in terms of the process technologies applications, right? And the first thing that comes to mind um, is essentially optics is fast, really high bandwidth. I can try to attack the problem of chip I.O. Um, electrical chips basically have limited pins. They need to pump up a lot of uh, data through this limited set of pins. The data rate has to be high. Copper wires are bandwidth limited, and so you have a problem, right? You cannot signal too fast. You have very complex circuitry uh, to build up equalization, communication, et cetera. So let's attack that problem. Historically, optics was very good eliminating co copper in longer distances. Maybe it can be as good doing it from the chip itself. So I'm showing you here an example of photonic link. So let's just go a little bit into how it works. Uh, we're going to use, now we're looking at the top of the chip, right? So I have an off-chip laser. It has multiple colors. Then we hit this grading coupler here. So this is this antenna structure. It will convert the light from a vertical fiber coming in into a horizontal mode that travels along the chip, the body of the transistor. And so we'll travel along this waveguide. And then I will have another piece of waveguide that's roped, circled in a ring. And this piece of waveguide will act as a notch filter for the wavelength that circles it an integer number of times. So basically, you can, you can think that that wavelength gets trapped in that ring indefinitely and dissipates, right? Um, and so, at that wavelength, that wavelength won't be able to, to get through, and I'll get essentially this notch in the transmission uh, properties. Now, I will make this ring, instead of being just passive silicon, I'll make it essentially an active device by creating a diode out of it. So I will we'll be able to deplete the charge out of that diode, and there's a well-known effect like plasma, uh, 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 optical carrier plasma effect that basically what it does is it changes the index of the ring based on how many carriers you have charge in that waveguide. If I change the index, I'm actually changing the wavelength that resonates in the ring, right? So that ring now, the resonance shifts to another wavelength. And if I keep my laser parked, let's say here, right, that now I'm seeing a difference in the transmission between these two states, right? And I can do simple binary modulation. Now I deplete all the carriers from the diode or I leave them in, and essentially I'm getting an electro-optic interaction. This is a simple binary modulation example. You can take this to completely analog type modulation, anywhere in between, I'll show you some examples. 
You can use this as interferometers or all sorts of other structures. So I'm showing you just the simplest kind of thing that we can use in electrical interconnects. Now, what I can do is by sizing the radius of each one of these rings just slightly differently, I can rasterize these notch, notches throughout the spectrum with some channelization, let's say 200 gigahertz apart. So I create a multi-carrier system, right, so that each one of these rings is natively positioned wherever these multiple colors are that are coming in, right? That way, I grow the number of channels over a single fiber through which I'm modulating the data. So I don't have to signal super fast on any one of these wavelengths. I can adjust the speed to meet other constraints in the system, for example, energy, right? And I'll show you how we do that optimization next. Some other tricks here, we basically can also forward the clock. So these are the, the data bits. I can also forward the clock. There's no el electrical kind of interference through that distribution path, so my clock is clean. At the receive end, which could be another chip, I will just have a passive ring resonator to drop the wavelength into a detector. And the receiver, I also do that same thing with the clock, so I don't need the clock data recovery circuits and I can simplify my link. Right, so that further reduces the energy of the whole system. Okay. So maybe wondering, there's something I'm not telling you here because it sounds too good. Uh, whenever you deal with resonant devices, you have some problems, right? They are, after all, very sensitive to everything because of a high Q, and here we're dealing with like a 10,000 Q factor on these ring resonators. So indeed, they are both sensitive to process mismatch, so geometry variations, and temperature. Because again, the index of uh, light in silicon essentially uh, changes with temperature quite a bit. So if your chip temperature moves, the thing moves around. And so we have this integrated tuning control. It looks kind of like a carrier recovery. You need to lock to a laser wavelength and keep being locked there um, while the whole thing is working. And so this is one of the key pieces of kind of engineering that you have to do to be able to enable these resonant systems. So I'll hopefully convince you today some examples that we've actually done that. And so we're enabling this kind of very low energy, very dense photonic technology. Right. Uh, when you have a system like this, you first need to kind of decide what space should I work and you know, is it worth going and developing this whole technology? What can I get ultimately out of it? How much energy? So, we did a little bit of a link modeling, and I'm here showing you two most important parameters in a photonic link. One is the overall insertion loss, just like, like in an RF kind of environment. What is your total insertion budget? That gives you back the implication of the amount of laser power needed to power up the whole system. Another one is the receive capacitance. And that one largely also determines what is the total laser power you need and what is your receiver sensitivity, it also determines the speed and power. But it also indicates what integration scenario you have. If you have two chips, one photonic, one electronic, then, and you connect them with micro bumps, then you're more in the 25 femtofarad plus category, maybe to fifth, up to 50. If you have monolithic solutions where you're really right, where photonic device is right next to the transistor, maybe 10 micron away or so, uh, you are kind of in this category of five femtofarads. So now you can start understanding what impact the integration has on the overall link characteristics, right? So we can see here that, you know, if we can do re reasonably good, really good photonics, 10 dB overall insertion losses, as we start increasing the data rate, um, we, from the same, let's say, pro source, like a processor that operates at a fixed few gigahertz rate and produces data, right? We will need to pay some amount of energy to serialize this data on a link, if our link is very fast, let's say 30 gigabits. That's the energy we wouldn't need to pay if we were completely parallel, that every produced bit just modulates a modulator, right? But that's extra circuitry we need to add. Then, at high speed transmit, uh, rec receiver, um, La uh, it basically implicates the growth in the laser power. And then transmitter is really burning energy just to try to maximize the zero to one distance to make it easier for the laser, right? To use less laser power for the same distance between a zero and one lamp. Because receiver at higher speeds is having harder time 
essentially recovering or distinguishing between the voltage levels. Right? And now if you go and add more capacitance, more loss, obviously laser power explodes. Right? And that's not what you want to do. Now I'm not showing you really the whole picture because that previous picture would tell you go very low in data rate, just maximize the number of wavelengths, and your sensitivity will be good. You don't have to, you can integrate the laser, the photons for a longer amount of time to produce a certain voltage at the receiver, and life will be good. So go very low in wavelengths. Right? But just in, like in CMOS circuits, there's a balance between leakage and dynamic energy, and you want to kind of be in between in your activity. The same thing happens in the photonic links. Uh, the thing I mentioned about thermal tuning of rings, well, thermally stabilizing the rings is just like completely static power, right? You're just running current through a resistor. There's nothing worse than that. And if you have too many of these rings, what ends up happening is you end up burning a lot of power on just tuning. So now on one hand, too many rings, too much power for tuning. On the other hand, essentially too few rings, you need to run them too very fast so your laser power is, blows up. And so the, and your serializer power and everything else. So as with everything in life, kind of the answer is moderation, right? So use sort of moderate data rates if your ultimate goal is extremely low energy, right? Now, that also depends on the overall bandwidth constraint through the waveguide, right? Depending on the application, I may want to have certain number of gigabits per second per fiber, per port in my network from my processor uh, or switch. And so we do this optimization across a number of desired wave uh, total throughputs. And you know, the message you should really get out of this is that you know, the optimum is pretty flat up until you start hitting like 30, 25, 30 gigabits per second. So if you're thinking about 50 gig, 100 gigabits per wavelength where telecom is going, that's not really most energy efficient. Right? So if you're worried about embedded systems, ASICs, where you want to still are limited by the energy envelope, you want to be up in that range, 10 to 25 gigabits per second. And you have plenty of bandwidth density to play with to basically trade that off against uh, sitting at 25 and not pushing 50 or 100 gigabits per second. So you're fine. So once we did this kind of analysis, we basically set up to build a demo system that will essentially try to demonstrate some of these features. And depending on time, I'll talk about either the one on the left or both. But we essentially looked at the processor memory system, which, was, which is, I think, even now, kind of the next maybe generation of what you would attack first. But we wanted to set the bar very high in terms of really looking after extreme energy efficiency in the system. So we ended up doing a little bit architecture study and trying to understand how we could re-engineer the processor memory system to leverage this very high bandwidth density and high energy efficiency of silicon photonics. And we built two prototypes. So one was in a logic process. This is a 45 nanometer uh, SOI chip that I'll talk about next. Um, and then we also built photonics in a CMOS periphery of a memory process. So um, that is bulk CMOS. And these two photonic technologies are drastically different. One on the left is what I already introduced. This is this SOI process where we make no process changes. In the other one, it's bulk CMOS, so there's no waveguide necessarily because there's no silicon in, in the oxide sandwich, and we had to do some other tricks to make things work. So if I get the time, I'll also get to that as well. So after a few years of hacking the process effectively uh, and building these things that we call essentially design templates, um, we were able to kind of get the first, world's first processor that communicates with light, right? So that's this chip over here. And what, how we were doing it is that from the get-go, we were assembling this hardware template. Hardware template had space for two cores, one megabyte of SRAM, and then here is basically SIRDIs. Um, you can see them more, more clearly here, which each ring resonator has its own uh, basically high-speed link SIRDIs, or backend, uh, both on the transmit and receive, uh, and receive side. And we have up to 11 parallel wavelengths, or I.O., basically they run on the same fiber. Right? So that's our, uh, all the electronics is adjusted to emulate essentially a memory interface, so we can 
use it essentially. Processor just sees a memory interface and sends transactions and, and things work. Um, and then throughout the years, we've been evolving the devices and circuits that belong to this template, right? From tape out to tape out, better modulators, better detectors, better drivers, et cetera, right? And so eventually, we're able to demonstrate this. If you look at the portfolio of devices, and I'll go through them, this is a, this is a grading coupler, uh, photo detector, and kind of a resonant modulator. Okay. So, um, I, I joke that this is probably the only chip in the world that produced two startup companies at once. And so out of it, the first part was, it was the first demonstration of RISC-V architecture that spun off SI-5 uh, with Kirsten and his students. And, uh, you know, with booting Linux on this same chip and getting reasonable speed and energy efficiency for a, a 45 process. So we're, the thing for us that was very important is that after we do even the substrate release that I'm showing you, this is, you're looking at the chip from the backside through very thin uh, oxide. Uh, we actually can basically benchmark the processor and see that none of the standard cells that comprise the processor in a digital flow were basically affected by any of these photonic structures. And you can be worried about pattern density and all these kinds of issues in advanced processes. But actually, this processor works, right? And so that's a very important thing for us, that we're not basically disadvantaging transistors and any other system that's being built. If you look, at, on the other hand, at photonic device performance, we're getting actually pretty amazing end-of-the-line losses even compared to, to straight-up silicon photonic processes. I'm showing here in the O-band where mostly data comm links work you know, a loss of about 3 dB per centimeter. Just to give you an idea, to get a ring resonator device be uh, functional as a modulator or detector, I need better than 20 dB per centimeter. So we're way better than what we actually need to have in the system. Right. Uh, if we look at the, the, uh, the gratings, these are essential elements, and as, as you will see, probably the most critical elements today in silicon photonics. How do you, without loss, couple the light in and out of the chips? You'll see that that loss accumulates and dominates your overall insertion. Uh, so being able to do these very sophisticated unidirectional grading couplers is kind of something that uh, we uh, learned how to do in time in these processes. CG photo detector was another place where we looked at it and while well, other companies can make huge investments in building 100% epitaxial germanium type detectors and significantly changing the process, we had to use what's out there. So we looked at the 45 nanometer PFETs and realized that there is basically a silicon germanium um, alloy that's added into the drain of the PFET to, to basically introduce a strain and speed up the transistor. And that shifts the, just the, the band gap just enough so that in the O band we can start to hope to get some responsivity out of it, right? And indeed, these first devices like I'm showing here, uh, which are just slab detectors, had like 2% responsivity. Well, guess what? I can build a link with 2% responsivity as a, just a, as a demonstrator, and you'll see some results with that. But in time, I can do more creative device designs that up that responsivity to half a ramp per watt. And now that's on par with pretty much anything you have out there if you combine it with very small parasitic capacitance that we have in this process. So I'm saying like something that looks maybe not as promising at the beginning, you should just think twice what in the design you can do before you give up on it, right? Because it comes for free, essentially. Uh, similar idea about the, the ring modulators. When you're doing the doping in the waveguide, Depending on how, what process you have, you can do it in different ways. The ultimate goal here is that when I apply voltage of any kind, I expel most of the volume of this ring where the mode overlaps. I expel the charge out of that volume, and then I bring it back. Right? So then I'm shifting my resonance the most for a given voltage. Now, that, allow, that forces you to play with the thickness of the depletion regions and the types of carriers or dopants that you can add to realize this at hopefully sub one volt kind of voltages or a few volts if you already have to go a little bit higher. Uh, 
Here in this process, we only could realize lateral junctions because it's a pure planar process. It's not a bipolar process where I can realize a vertical junction like the base uh, collector kind of emitter style because I cannot control really accurately the junction depth. Right? I also cannot uh, basically confine the mode into some intermediate volume like with partial etch, again, for that lateral junction to be very efficient. So what we did here, it's hard to see, but you'll see it on later slides, we have now interleaved junctions. So P and go like a spokes on a bicycle wheel around. And why? Because I have a 45 nanometer process where I can define these junction regions very accurately, lithographically, right? I cannot control the depth, but I can control the width very nicely, right? So again, using the advantage of the process to be able to design the device that you want. Um, that's maybe visible a little bit more here in the 3D rendering of the GDS, where you see gray and blue as little spokes. And then I can essentially use the density of the interconnect to come down with all these contact vias on the inner side um, to be able to contact the regions. Now, this is really a disk modulator, so it's a little bit wider, and the mode goes on the outside to not overlap with all these via contacts. But this is real 3D rendering of the layout, so it gives you an idea of the complexity of contacts and stuff that comes in, right? Uh, you don't obviously draw that by hand. We actually go and have automated scripts, skill code that draw all this stuff for you so that uh, you can change the radius and all, all these coupling gaps and stuff and don't have to worry about hand managing the, the layout of the device. So this was one of the first demonstrations that's part of, of, the, of the processor system where we were looking at, the target was 10 gig. So this was like five gig at 30 femtojoules and we're able to drive it about up to 12 gigabits per second. So it was kind of low energy, not too high a data rate, so just for the processor memory type link application. You see that the modulator is essentially less than 30 micron away from the analog driver circuitry and then this is all place and routed digital standard cell stuff around it. So it's kind of like a system on a chip design. We treat photonics just as analog circuits. We put them on, block the place and route, and then do the, the, the other system on the chip stuff around it. Uh, on the receiver side, again, we use very simple circuits. Right? The key here to get the, a really good current sensitivity is to be able to use high resistance because uh, so our parasitic capacitance is relatively small. Right? It's, we're only, again, 10 micron away from, uh, from the photodetector. Okay. So these designs were around 10, 12 gigabits per second, uh, which was kind of the target for the program. We put the whole thing together, and we can now do like margining. All receivers have embedded bit rate checkers, so we don't need any external equipment. Uh, this shows you kind of the profile of the laser power going in and out of the chip. And you see immediately, 4 dB loss for input-output couplers, right? These couplers that we used in this link demonstration were bidirectional, so single silicon slab, just grating, and then the light shoots in both directions, essentially, as you uh, go from the waveguide out. So you lose 3 dB immediately, and then another dB, essentially, on uh, extra imperfections of the mode overlap and things like that. Uh, we do have on the same chip as, uh, I'll show you like a 1 dB type coupler that uses these unidirectional things. But you always have a trade off do you put the latest device in your link or you use a workhorse device in your link when you're trying to demonstrate? So this is using kind of a workhorse device. Uh, when you look at the pie chart of where the energy goes, receiver is analog, so at lower rates, like 5, 10 gigabits per second, it will burn basically the most amount of energy. The modulator is really tiny. And then, since we're at a lower rate as well, remember that at lower rates, your thermal dissipation for stabilizing the ring also is reasonable. So in this case, not dominating the link budget, but kind of balanced out with the receiver, right? And again, this, when you take it all together, is very comparable to kind of the most advanced heterogeneous platforms. For example, this is an Oracle paper, 680 femtojoules per bit compared to ours. Uh, and, but they have like very sophisticated, customized photonics with the latest kind of CMOS. Uh, 
when we go and in introduce all of our latest components that we had, the uh, better photodetectors um, and 1DB couplers that are on the same exact chip, just not in the link, we get a, basically 560 uh, femtojoules of laser wall plug energy. And that's with a commercial laser. Uh, and so this actually tells you that we can put together a link. In fact, this was two years ago. That's about a picojoule per bit per wavelength and just ship the bits out of the processor chip anywhere you want, two kilometers away, okay? So it's pretty good. But you need to also figure out how to package the whole thing and demonstrate, and that's what I'm gonna uh, show you. So we had to do this sub flip chip and the substrate release step. So this is what we do once we package the chip. We optically enable the chip, okay? And then you, you can put their waveguides essentially here and grading couplers, and then you can put the fiber arrays uh, on glass blocks and couple from the backside through basically this thin piece of uh, oxide. Once you're done with that, you can then carry this along anyway. And this, by the way, this is all done in a university lab. So it's a kind of a crude thing, but I would stress the critical thing is this is still a completely flip chip package solution with, which modern ASICs really want because they want a low impedance connection, essentially low parasitics between for both power delivery and high speed signals. So no wire bonds, no mess like that, right? Okay, so we built this demo where uh, we have our risk pr process, our chip ask, acting as a processor on one side and using the transmit and receive optical stuff. And then we configure that same chip as just a frame buffer. It's, basic, it's basically an instruction and data buffer on the other side, so we use that SRAM. And, but it's configured kind of to use a DDR kind of a protocol to talk between the two chips to emulate the memory access, right? And then we power it up, so hopefully, uh, let me see if I can, okay, escape the laser mode. Okay. Maybe, ah, okay. I'll show you a few minutes of the video. Again, this, it's this, the chip. Um, about 70 million transistors, mostly in the SRAM, but essentially around Pentium 4 style uh, total amount, and thousands of photonic devices that we're able to put on there. Um, about one megabyte of memory, and, and again, this memory interface between. Right? We use these chips also to add continuously new photonic devices at the top, and then we innovate on them. These are the processor banks that I mentioned, and also the transceivers. Again, you see each slice is like separately placed and routed. That's basically a high-speed link, right? And then the resonance structures. Uh, the chip is about three by six millimeters, so it's actually really tiny compared to, you know, a quarter, for example. So what we're doing here, we're doing a little stability demonstration. So we're doing 3D pot rendering uh, from, okay, yeah, from the frame buffer. And what we're showing you on the right side is that we use the illuminator to heat up the chip because the processor doesn't heat up itself that, that much. So we were really stressing it. And what you're seeing at the upper um, point over here is that the heater power drops whenever we illuminate the chip. So the heater is compensating for the increase in chip temperature to try to keep the ring locked. Uh, you see here at the top the optical power basically stays constant, right? Which means that the ring is locked. The other thing that's important is that this is uncoded. So whatever bits you're fetching from the frame buffer, they cause different optical density also of energy that's captured in the ring and the ring loop still stabilizes it. That's called like self-heating effects. So we have a special loop to deal with that as well. Uh, and now, if I turn everything off, you see basically errors popping up uh, because it's essentially raw uncoded, so I'm fetching 10 gigahertz per Kelvin is the shift in the ring, and the ring bandwidth is 20 gigahertz. So you can immediately see a fraction of a Kelvin, essentially, if the loop is not really stable. And this is what's scaring industry from going after ring resonators. But we basically said, okay, if we can deal with loops, and loops is what circuit designers know how to do, and electrical engineers in general, 
we can overcome a significant fear of the industry and essentially go, go after these very energy efficient, very dense structures. Right? Uh, so again, I mentioned that these structures we can build in very uh, dense and basically change the radius of the rings to rasterize the center frequency across the spectrum. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that these structures are periodic. Every wavelength that fits integer number of times in the radius actually is trapped. So, and then the space between these two periodic resonances is called free spectral range. So on this plot, for example, on the top, let me just do the pointer quick. Uh, we have a ring resonator zero. Well, that one repeats here. So we have about three and a half, almost four terahertz of free spectral bandwidth. And that kind of tells you how many channels you can fit. Because, you know, down to 100 gigahertz spacing between these channels is kind of reasonable for crosstalk purposes. So we can fit almost like 40 channels, 32 very comfortably in this. And then on every channel modulating at, you know, 25 to 100 gig depending on the application, you're somewhere between a terabit and three terabits per second, kind of what you can get out of the, per fiber. That's a lot of bandwidth, right? Um, now, one thing I want you to note here is that how precise the process is. I'm showing you the ring resonances as produced, so no tuning, right? And nominally, if I take one ring on one wafer and another ring, that same ring on another wafer or chip, the absolute frequency difference between these two rings can go up to 600 gigahertz, right? Uh, but here, uh, or basically three nanometers, right? But here, I'm showing all of the rings on one chip in order across a millimeter and a half, which means that local matching that depend, depends most on the film thicknesses from one ring to another across this millimeter half is phenomenal. We basically have 50 to 60 gigahertz only local mismatch. And so all I need to do is basically make sure these rings are spread around equally and I'm, I'm good enough to go, right? Now, you will notice this gap here. Well, that's a grad student at 4 a.m. not punching the right radius of the ring to rasterize across. So we get that as a systematic mismatch. So all the rings are slightly ganged uh, and we, we have this gap here. But for example, here that wasn't as, uh, as severe on the, on the other received side. This is actually really important for us because if rings were not as stable process-wise, we would need to put in a lot of power to reshuffle them and bring them essentially back to some order or do that in the electrical domain as well. But the process is really stable, so we like that. So it's a demo, essentially all channels working, so it's about 80 gig uh, per 80, 90 gig per, per fiber for this application, so that was kind of a really Nice thing for us to see the stability of all the slices. And, you know, after that, we really started looking at what can we do to show that what's the extent of the limitations of this technology. We did 10 gigabits per second. It's very energy efficient. But can we use these same ring resonator structures to signal faster on a wavelength? And, or maybe do more levels of modulation because the ring is inherently nonlinear. So can we uh, show how to scale the data rate in the best possible way? So what I'm showing you here is uh, Sajad's work, was actually presented recently at ISCC, where we kind of blended the properties of the photonic device with some uh, cool kind of circuit designs. But the key insight was that, remember these interleaved junctions that I mentioned. So they're here. In a normal modulator that's binary, we would drive all P with one voltage and all N with another voltage, right? And that would just be binary modulation. But then we realized we have 60 something segments in this ring. So if we drive each one with a separate control signal, we can create an optical D to A converter. Because we expel just a little bit of charge out of a diode by do it, polarizing only one segment and then Essentially, we do a D2A type conversion without having an actual electrical D2A. And you know, this is like a six bit uh, type of D2A converter. Building that at 20 giga samples per second is not cheap, and, it's, and you're likely are not gonna get all six bits effective. So 
we thought, why, why not try it? And so we, we also built a little encoder, a lookup table, so we can essentially um, decide if we do, for example, multi-level modulation here, how many, how to map these levels to different segments in this uh, optical D2A converter. So we created a little uh, pulse amplitude modulation, basically, uh, transmitter. And for PAM2, PAM4, we're able to get about 40 gigabits per second. But another key component we had to do is essentially build, bring in a PLL very close to the uh, transmitter because now you're trying to run really fast and you can't afford to have degradation in your clocking. So the whole thing, you know, we build these chips that have a lot of different prototype devices and circuits. A whole transceiver, transmitter is basically with a PLL is kind of this here, right? Um, and then a PLL on top. Again, it's placed and routed like a, like a normal chip, a system on a chip with analog front end and a modulator. And then depending on which mode we turn, we're either in binary mode or running in multi-level mode. So this is a PAM4 uh, I, so we double the data rate immediately for same clock frequency, right? Um, again, one of the interesting things, now that we eliminated the electrical DAC, the optical conversion is within that range that we have uh, of about 5 dB insertion loss and excision ratio is very linear. So we just use 0 to 15 codes spread uh, linearly. Again, if you look at the link transmit specs, the PLL dominates the digital backend uh, in terms of area. The photonics is really tiny, and that's the reason because we use these very small compact ring uh, modulators. And again, in terms of energy, it's really the clocking and the surdies in the back end. The modulator driver energy is tiny in these cases. Again, if you were thinking of doing Max Zender type modulators or things like that, huge millimeter size devices, five picojoules per bit modulation energy. Right? So it's two orders of magnitude worse. Some improved receiver topologies, again, you can use insights between the device and the circuit to create, for example, uh, receiver circuits with very high supply noise rejection, which is kind of the key if you try to integrate these things in big ASICs, uh, without having to do special regulation or anything like that, because we use essentially, uh, in this case, like a splitter and two detector, two photo detectors. Further cases, you can use one ring resonator that's kind of split in two. But then this circuit essentially creates essentially a differential rejection after the first stage. And you can see kind of on these curves, the faster you try to go, uh, essentially you get self-limiting, uh, by, limited by the common mode, uh, finite common mode rejection of the supply noise uh, that's caused by the same signal that's coming in. So you kind of limit your SNR if you don't have this type of scheme. Yeah, so I'd like kind of to stop here uh, and just compare um, kind of what we tried to do when we set out this architectural study with where we are with, with, with the chips, right? So when you try to do some process development like this, the architectural study motivates you, but they have to use some device assumptions. So we said, okay, if we could meet these specs, we would get, let's say, 10x better energy efficiency in our I.O., right, and get the processor memory interfaces so much better. And now you can see here, essentially, in green is all the specs that we were able to overachieve, and some of them were still not there yet, like, like on this demonstration, for example, this is 180 nanometer receiver, right, so it's obviously a lot more power than this, but in more advanced process, it will be less. But like on a lot of the others, we were like very close, so we're pretty happy about, about this platform. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to stop here and uh, try to get some questions, because I understand there's a lot of students in the class here, so yeah, shoot away. Questions? Let's thank our speaker first. And questions? So the free spectral range for your ring is around 20 nanometer, 30 nanometer? Um, okay, so the, the question about the free spectral range. Um, yeah, so it's about 20-ish nanometer. At, in O-band, you're basically at about 180 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz per nanometer, yeah, about 3.2 terahertz, yeah, 
one of your slides, you have these two chips and then with a laser input and an optical amplifier in between. Um, your laser wavelength is 1185 nanometer, so any reason to choose that wavelength instead of a more standard wavelength? Yeah, this is a great question. So the question is about why use 1180 nanometer wavelength? So in this early, so remember that we used SIGI uh, alloy uh, as the photodetector. So um, in these processes, 45 and even 32, the percentage of germanium in the SIGI alloy is actually in the low 20s at best, right? So it it's just shifts the band gap just a little bit to make it a bit more responsive. Um, at 1180, the responsivity is the highest. So at the time we used the slab photodetectors, we basically wanted to get as low in wavelength as we can to get the best absorption. Uh, then, as you can guess, as this thing starting getting more kind of uh, commercial interest and we wanted to spin out some, some transition effort, we were really looking to reposition into the center of the O-band, basically 1300s. Then what you would do is use resonance structures. And this result that I'm showing here uh, of 0.44 amps per watt, close to 0.5 actually with some devices today, you basically wrap that, you create the same ring resonator essentially, a very similar, just PIN diode. Um, and then you trap the right travels multiple times through that ring, gets more absorbed, right? Um, for the same kind of loss. And that allows you to shift the wavelength to somewhere where you're less responsive, like 1300, but still responsive enough because you're uh, essentially amplification factor inside the ring as uh, finesse of the ring is much higher, right? Thanks, good question. More questions, yes? What was the latency between die? Okay, so the question is what, what was the latency in the, in the processor memory demonstration? We used, uh, it was mostly dominated by the length of the fiber. So we essentially used, as far as I believe, about four meters. So you would have essentially um, like four nanoseconds per meter or something like that. So about 20 nanoseconds one way, 20 nanoseconds another way. Um, and kind of the, the access is not kind of as bad as the, the DRAM itself, because right, it's just emulating DRAM. But it was around 40, 50 nanoseconds. Um, I was unclear about the plot that you had where you showed the different uh, lanes and then you had your next mode. <coughs> Could we just move to that plot? And you were, show, you were trying to show the <coughs> mismatch between chips within it. Oh, oh, yes. Oh. Uh, the, you mean the, this? Yeah. So if I understood this correctly, uh, these are the different lanes that you have on one chip and you're trying to ex explain how you know it, it's going to shift for a different chip. Now, if I'm doing chip-to-chip -chip communication and you want to line them up, how do you compensate for that? Is that thermal? Is that with bias? What, what do you do? Yeah, this is a great question. So the question is, if you look at the transmission curves here, um, we're showing a single waveguide and all the rings on that waveguide. So you see a bunch of notches where the center frequencies of these rings are. Now, on the same waveguide, they're very matched. Right, so small process variations show you know, small non-uniformities. Ideally, the space here is the same as the space here. So you see a little bit, 50, 60 gigahertz kind of offset, right? Out of three, three terahertz. But it could be that on the, a completely different chip, notch zero starts like here. Again, you will get them all in order, zero, one, two, three, four but they will all be moved because the film thickness was slightly different across the wafer, or wafer to wafer, et cetera, right? Um, the key there is two things. One, that resonances are periodic, right? And another one is that with a simple barrel shifter in the back end, I can re-rotate the bits. But the key there is that I drop all the wavelengths in one place. I don't do wavelength routing. So there's a whole body of optical networks and stuff like that where they do wavelength routing, picking off each wavelength at some destination to go to a different part, that's actually very bad for these things. You can do it, but you have to waste a lot of energy to stabilize the rings in absolute wavelength. And you don't really want to do that, right? So it's a blend of these like circuit tricks we use, like a simple barrel shifter, for example, to just, and, and you, you know, this is kind of a one-time thing reconfigure it essentially and always move the bits. And then if the temperature rolls the whole thing around, 
Well, again, you will track with the barrel only channel to channel variations locally with the heater and the rest essentially with the electronic backhand. And the things will roll around anyway, so you don't need essentially to track across more than 3.2 terahertz. Right. Great. One quick question I had. You, you talked a little bit about the flip chip and then the interface to the actual the platform. I, I, I missed, so for the optical devices, what is the exact interface? It's not a solder bump for sure. Oh, okay, yeah. So the so question is how, how does the optical device get inputs and outputs, right? So you take, yeah, so electrical connection is between a transistor and an optical device in most scenarios, right? I want a transistor to either receive a current from a photodetector or I want transistor to change the voltage on a modulator, right? Uh, we have some designs where we kind of directly pad out the photonic devices just for testing purposes, right? In that case, we, we, we would not do C4 bumping, right? We would basically just probe the die. But whenever we're packaging for like a system application, essentially it's just a normal electronic chip. You do flip chip C4 on organic substrate or high density FR4 board, and then you have some circuitry, and, not, and that circuitry talks essentially at metal one contact to the, the device. The device is really kind of like another resistor or another diode that's in the front end, right? So you talk to it through metal one, contact via down into a device, right? Doped region, yeah. Okay. So that's the electrical. The optical connection happens, at least in our demos, through the backside. So you flip the chip, you remove the substrate, and then you optically couple through only 150 nanometers of uh, 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 buried oxide right into the silicon layer of the device. Right? Then the electrical, won't they be on the top side at that point, the pads? Uh, they are actually at the bottom because the chip is flipped. Okay, right. I'll so, ask you about that later. I, yeah. I'm still a little confused. Okay, good, any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs>